good evening, everybody. Um, we'll start the meeting. Uh, the first one is uh, substitutes nominated for this meeting. Not there, no apologies. Right. Um, remind members to declare an, an interest as and where necessary. Um, a, the meeting is open to the to the public. Uh, so we'll go on to proposed changes to project management. Um, Mark, are you ready to go? Thank you for that, uh, Chair. Um, I'm going to do a few introductory words and I'm going to ask um, Rob Summerfield to take um, the committee through the presentation, which I understand has been previously circulated. So, um, so I suppose in terms of an introduction, um, I joined uh, Calderdale Council as an interim back in March of this year. And one of the things I was asked to look at was the council's capital program management system. Um, I have done an initial uh, review of the existing systems and processes in place and um, given, um, if you like, uh, uh, my recommendations to uh, effectively uh, the various parties involved. And obviously this is part of this process. Um, and without further ado, Chair, if you are happy, I'll hand over to um, Rob Summerfield, who will take us through the presentation, which summarises some of my conclusions and recommended ways forward. Uh, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end of that together with Rob, if that's OK, Chair. All right. And so do you want to, both you and, your, you and Rob will leave questions until right to the end of your presentation then? Okay. Um, I, I think it might be easier to do it that way, Chair, yeah. because some, sometimes yeah. questions get answered during the course of the presentation. Programme dropper as well, because he's adding, he's nodding his head to say he wants the same, so. <laughs> uh, Super. Over to you then, Robert. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I wonder if I could get permission to share my screen, if that's all right. Um, I, I seem to have the green button. I think it, I'll, I'll try and make it work. Um, Okay. Yes, I've given that permission, Rob. Go ahead. Oh, thank you very much, Tilly. Much appreciated. There we go. Can you see a, a blue screen with Coldwell Next Chapter written on it? Can everyone see that okay? Yeah. Good stuff. The nodding heads. That's good. Okay, then. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll whiz through this because I know there'll be lots of questions towards the end here. But uh, basically, this, this presentation just provides a summary of what we've done so far in terms of preparing to uh, review the way in which we treat um, our, our capital portfolio, our programmes and our projects, and, and provides you some of the ideas of the individual work streams which we're currently delivering um, to improve the way in which we deliver our capital programme moving forward. Uh, there's an aim here that just, just, just very, very briefly summarises what we're aiming to do here, which is basically to develop a, a system of project management and the operations on the, on, under, that, that underpin that system to allow us to effectively manage what is becoming a very large portfolio of capital projects. And I'll go on to talk about the level of scale um, for elected members um, as I move through the presentation. So a bit of background, really, and, and just, just in addition to what Mark's already mentioned. Um, when Mark came into his role as an interim within the council, uh, very kindly uh, worked with us to provide a, a review, basically, of, of the way in which capital programmes are delivered throughout the council. So not only those that are delivered by the major project service, um, but those that are carried out elsewhere as well within both the Regeneration and Strategy Directorate, but also further afield in other directorates, such as adult care, children's social care, for example, and public services. Um, the review itself covered um, previous um, audit and review findings, which members here will be already aware of. It also reviewed the, um, the, the scale of the current workload and balanced that against what we have in terms of operational capacity to deliver that workload. A review was, was also taken in terms of what we knew at that current time, and this, this continues to, to the present day in, in terms of what additional work is likely to, to come towards the council on the basis of our recovery from the current pandemic in relation potentially to, to Brexit or devolution and so on. Um, the review also considered the, uh, the current processes that we have in the Council for governance of capital schemes and how they work and whereabouts they are, that th those functions report. So in terms of the findings of that review, um, 
there was a, there was a few things highlighted. So in terms of the council's overall approach to capital schemes, and, and remember this is multiple services and directorates, there is a lack of a single uniform um, system, which uh, which is in operation right the way across the uh, the council, and that's that's not altogether unexpected given that, that the majority of the projects are emergent and that they come um, either from external funding which is released from central government or other means and obviously work across multiple directorates as well but again to improve matters a, a, a more uniform system would be um, a very effective tool to do that. In terms of governance the, the arrangements themselves are relatively complex um, and, and quite um, time consuming to administer and again that's something which again reduces our efficiency. Um, there is a focus on delivering the, the outputs, the projects themselves, as opposed to the outcomes, um, that being that um, there's a focus on, on project rather than program management. I'll, I'll go on to talk about that in a little while. And there's some significant uh, challenges in terms of capacity um, within directorates, which are delivering um, major pieces of, of capital works. At the moment, obviously, we've, we've um, established some time ago the major projects service. The lion's share of projects in terms of monetary value sit with major projects, or although the, the, the number of projects actually, uh, only 40 of those sit within major projects. There's around 200 other projects which are in uh, progress across the rest of the council, which are devolved to individual services and directorates. But the lion's share of the money, shall we say, in the largest scheme sit with major projects. And that's been established effectively to govern those projects in a similar way across the piece. In terms of the conclusions of the review, uh, there was a clear, clear requirement to develop a more robust programme management system to deliver the, the capital portfolio as a single entity. There's a requirement to expand the role uh, which has already been delivered by major projects much further to coordinate capital projects more widely across the council. Um, there's also requirements highlighted here in terms of our project management operations, our governance, um, that, that do, do need some improvement, particularly now given the council's um, reduced capacity to just to ensure that we can actually fully um, resource individual projects. So we're looking at some creative and innovative ways to apply resource to individual capital schemes as they come forward and obviously with a view to more um, capital coming into the council on the basis of a recovery from either the pandemic or through the devolution process. In terms of the scale of the current portfolio, now this, this diagram here um, was uh, brought together in, uh, in May of this year, and it provides a summary of the capital portfolio, which is just within regeneration strategy as a directorate only. So it doesn't include the other directorates, but the lion's share of the capital schemes sit within regeneration and strategy. As you can see, that's quite a large number. Um, in terms of volume, um, in, in, in terms of pound notes, um, the majority of this sits with major projects who run a portfolio called Calderdale Next Chapter, which I'm sure members will have seen advertised and obviously there's a lot of um, comms work that goes on in, in bringing together that portfolio of work. The other um, services and directorates which implement capital schemes are also listed below. Um, as you can see that there's, uh, there's quite a lot there in terms of housing and the green economy. Our um, corporate assets and facilities management service from a small portfolio focused on the council's own buildings. There's the, uh, the Weave Homes project there, which is a housing development um, sort of arm's length um, arrangement that the council runs. And clearly there's also the strategic infrastructure service there who are responsible for capital works um, on the highway, which um, are smaller in scale, I suppose, than, than those which are carried out by major projects as part of the West Yorkshire uh, Plus Transport Fund. The final one to mention there is that we've been recently successful in acquiring funds through both the town deal um, and the future high street fund and also heritage action zone programs there and there's quite a lot of money coming into the council for that which needs to be administered and spent effectively in terms of the next steps following the outcomes of the review there's a number of different work streams which were brought out and they've been agreed through obviously the council's senior leadership team called clt and then further through the council in terms of the uh, the council's executive now, the, um, the main findings here and main recommendations were to develop a, an ICT-based programme management system, very similar to that which is currently operated by other authorities, including the combined authority. 
are they focused really on bringing all the projects together this, so that they can be more effectively managed and also that we can integrate our project and program management systems with wider business applications such as the finance system for example it allows us to streamline the way in which we uh, we manage the schemes and also reduces the administrative requirement as well um, we need to look again at, at capital program governance it's very important that we develop a streamlined approach to governance because at the moment there's quite a confusing and complicated system that we use to manage our, our, our capital schemes so we'll be looking at, at working with 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 members to um, and obviously senior managers to develop a more streamlined and less administrative hungry um, process for governance uh, in terms of the uh, the program management office which is proposed here we're going to start to look now at establishing a full PMO within Calderdale um, and that a, a program management office is, is effectively an office which allows the coordination um, a function shall we say that allows the coordination um, of um, capital program and project management delivery and also streamlines how projects come into being in the first place how they're initiated and how they move through and are scrutinized and provide assurance to uh, individual project management technical project managers technical assistance administrative and project support as well so it's important that we have a, co a combined facility to uh, to deliver that in Calderdale given the scale of what we're uh, going to be delivering over the next few years and it's important that that's developed and that's one of those work streams. We're also going to be looking at the programme management roles and responsibilities just to make sure that we've got the right personnel in the right roles within the, uh, the, the whole enterprise for delivering capital schemes. We're also going to be looking specifically as well about what sort of project support work we need um, to assist project managers and also technical support um, arrangements that are required, things like legal support, perhaps communication support, or that might be development management support as well. And again, that's one work stream that we'll be focusing on. In terms of the considerations that we're going to be undertaking as part of this review, members, is just basically the first one is, is really we want to start to, to not, not, necessarily, not necessarily blue sky thinking, but we want to make a, a real clear break with the, the old ways of, of, of capital project management. We're looking at the, what, what, what effectively works. Uh, what works well um, for um, not only Coldvale but also has, has been proven to work well elsewhere, taking that learning and building it into the tools and techniques and the governance processes that we, uh, we intend to use moving forward. Uh, we're also going to be taking um, full account obviously of past audits and audit points which have come, come up and, and not necessarily been fully addressed. Again, we're going to be bringing those right to the fore and making sure that we address all of those as part of this review looking very closely at our, our whole portfolio um, and linking our portfolio and the outputs and outcomes that we that we deliver as part of our projects and programs directly to the strategic uh, priorities which are set by the council so obviously we've got our three priorities at the moment around climate change reducing inequalities and in our prosperous towns it's important that whatever we deliver is in line with those those priorities and we're using very much the assurance process provided by the PMO to ensure that happens. Um, again we're looking to implement a model that's, that's very much focused on, on what our communities need um, and particularly ensuring that we are structured effectively so that all our communities within Calderdale benefit from um, funding either from devolution but also we're able to recover from COVID-19 and again Realism has to be at the um, at the back of this, really, and, and obviously we, we can't make all capital schemes completely um, painless in terms of their implementation. There obviously will be some um, disruption, um, but what we want to ensure is that we've got sufficient processes and, 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 and procedures in, in, in the council to ensure that any pain associated with delivery of large road schemes or anything like that, for example, is minimised um, as, as much as is possible and those schemes are delivered as efficiently and quickly as possible to minimise any other issues. Um, in terms of the way we're delivering this, as I say, we've got a number of work streams here. Um, one is obviously to establish a framework for governing the project itself. Two, to look at how we um, improve our governance process um, across the council. We'll also be considering how we implement policy into that and talk about how we link what we deliver to the, the priorities of the council. There's a process definition and improvement phase, which basically looks at um, looking at what is the best way of delivering projects right across the whole council and improving 
that scheme implementing a single way of doing things and, and allowing us to uh, bring in a ICT system to standardise that and make it more efficient across the board and provide support to project managers. The final work stream there looks at operation management and that's around the roles and responsibilities of individual project managers but it also looks at the way in which we charge staff time to capital schemes to ensure that we are fully recovering all the council's cost to individual capital schemes, particularly those which are externally funded. And that's, uh, that, that's a very important thing for us to do, to do to ensure that we're building a key competence in project management for the long term, that it is sustainable in the long term. And we keep that, those skills, experience and those, those officers to ensure that we can continue to deliver very large, significant schemes to regenerate the borough. Um, just to highlight to, to elected members, this, this is the oversight board for this, this entire enterprise. You can see it's, it's, it's a very senior level board and contains some very senior members of CLT and other decision makers and, and subject matter experts, such as our, our corporate lead for digital that can assist us with delivering this scheme. It's multi-directorate and includes representatives from both adult social care and uh, children's social care departments, including HR as well and legal. Uh, and that's about all I've got for you. So obviously happy to take questions either to myself or, or to Mark uh, as uh, as members see fit, Chair. Right. Um, can we go to the full screen so I can see hands when the... <laughs> Indeed, I'm just trying to work out how to unhide my... Ah, there we go. Stop, Chair. Done. Great. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from anyone? Um, Stephen? Thank you, Chair. I've, I've actually got five questions, so I might as well ask them all at once, do you think, Mark and Robert, or do you want to go through them one at a time? Uh, might be easier to go through them one at a time via you, you, Chair. It's just otherwise I might forget what the third or fourth one is. Is that OK, Councillor Lee? Of course it is, yes, thank you. Um, first of all, if we could just go back... Don't do it now, but going back to one of the slides that was up a moment ago, there was a picture of Calderdale uh, and it said 558 million and pointing down to projects that totaled 205 million. So it was 353 million pounds out. Now, I'm sure you'll know what that is, but I don't understand that uh, particular slide. Um, if it's a very brief answer, can you tell me now? Otherwise, I'll go on to the questions. I, I think we probably can clear that one up straight away, Councillor Lee. Rob, would you like you. to explain the discrepancy between those two figures, please? Uh, you, uh, I'm afraid, Councillor Lee, broke up a little bit, but I think, uh, did you say it was about 300 out, did you say? 353 million, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the, the bit. On the slide, there was a, a section that's allocated to major projects. That's the, the major project slice of that, that, that 558 million pounds. Would it be easier if I put it back on screen? I don't want to delay things. It's such a difference. They're obvious. There's obvious. No, I, I think the difference is, is Councillor Lee, is that the, the total size of the council's capital programme is the larger figure. Yeah. Mm. The figure is, is that, um, that proportion of the total capital programme, which is currently managed by the major projects team led by Rob Summerfield. OK, thank you. Um, right. So... These are comments that I would make in business. So I'm speaking more as a businessman than as a conservative councillor now, and that, that's sincere. And what I want, like everybody else, is the best results for Calderdale at all times. So uh, don't take any of this personally, please. This is, this is a business meeting. Okay. Um, on capital projects, I think it's, it's known that there are serious problems with uh, late delivery and major budget overruns. So we've got a series of recent examples of that that nobody's happy about. Um, so I do think there are uh, problems with governance and I think you alluded to that uh, towards the end of the presentation, Robert. Um, now, interestingly, there's nothing in the aspirations that we've been through about uh, evaluating the justification uh, of the proposals for projects. And what I, one thing I do find difficult in, in my role as a 
politicians in local politics here, is that I find there's insufficient justification often between an idea and a proposal to, to do something or go ahead with very large sums of money, um, which for me would require a lot more justification if I was evaluating uh, something that was presented to the board of a company about future expenditure. I want to see payback rates. I want to see sensitized in analyses of the best and the worst and the most realistic scenario in order to make a decision. So have you any comment to, uh, to make about that, please? It doesn't seem a lot of time is spent on the justification. Um, if, if you're happy, Chair, I'll, I'll lead off and, and Rob can chip in as and when he thinks I might have missed something. So I think what the, the presentation we've had this evening is, if you like, the, the key issues that the review which has just started, will be seeking to address. Um, I think one of the things which it will address is both the connection of individual capital projects to the key priorities of the council. Uh, and I'm not saying that the projects don't currently link to those key priorities at all, but what we'll be trying to do is to develop a system where there's a clear golden thread between those priorities and how each of the individual capital projects links directly to those key council priorities in a more um, uh, open way so you can see that very clearly. Um, and the second um, issue I think you raised was about how projects are developed and um, effectively will be working to um, produce greater clarity with regards to a series of gateways projects may well go through in the future. So right through from a project mandate stage, through to an outline business case stage, through to a full business case stage. And obviously as they pass through those various different uh, parts in the process, the level of detail attached to those, including option appraisals and costs of different options will be um, further developed. And that's when Rob alluded to uh, new computer systems um, that would effectively, um, potentially, one of the options we're looking at is closely following um, the systems developed by the um, West Yorkshire Combined Authority, which have these clear OBCs, FBCs, and clear um, decision points throughout that. So this is not a criticism of the current system, it's just a question of, if you like making it um, clearer about what stages need to be signed off at what point. And that would bring, um, I think the council more closely aligned with some of the best practices adopted by the private sector. Uh, through, through you chair, just, just, uh, just an additional point is just to say as well, that one of the things that, that this will do is, is also bring the whole portfolio together um, one of the things that, that is, is quite challenging, I think, looking from the outside in at the capital um, portfolio is just the sheer number of projects. They're all funded and financed in a different way. Some are external, externally funded, some through, come through the council's capital programme. Um, so that they're all funded in different ways. They've all got business cases which are drafted in, 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 in different ways as well. By bringing them together under a single assurance process, hopefully that will provide elected members with a bit more clarity about how they feed into the whole and how they feed in, into those three priorities as well and also give us more ability really to challenge projects which we feel might not necessarily link directly into the council's priorities or, or if priorities change for example um, it might give us more ability to to take projects out and close them if we don't feel that they are um, they are moving in the direction the council wants to continue to work in. Another thing that makes this complicated as well is many of these projects take a number of years to come through. So obviously business justification um, for many schemes is, is some years previously. Um, so again, it, 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 by bringing them together, I hopefully give you a bit more information about how that works as well, what stages individual projects are and allow you to monitor them more carefully. Thank you. I've just uh, one observation and a final uh, question to us, I did indicate that at the start. Um, in the uh, presentation, I saw somewhere 
I think you've recognised this as a problem. It, it, you've uh, said capacity um, has been problematic because there was insufficient uh, capacity to, to embark on, on the project. Oh, well, the projects have been embarked upon without sufficient capacity. And uh, my argument there is, um, I'm sure in an ideal world, you would always want to ensure that before we embark on a project, there is sufficient capacity and perhaps that's being, being addressed. But I think my overall comment on this is it, it, it is now a statement of laudable aspirations. You know, I agree with what's in there, but uh, the agenda item is pro about proposed changes rather than what we, what we hope to do. And to be honest, since this was identified as something that could be lo looked at as a project. I had expected more meat on the bone about what we were going to do rather than a forward commitment and aspiration to do things to fix things that we already know about. So comments on that please and I'm done. Thank you For again through you chair. Um, I've, I've been involved in a number of these reviews and implementations of different capital program management systems. And uh, effectively, the, the first thing I would say is um, they do take time. Um, they are not quick fixes. Um, they are quite significant changes to how local authorities um, plan and implement uh, not just individual projects, but programs that, if you like, clearly link back to clear council priorities. And I think what Rob has done is identify a number of clear um, work streams. Um, the first of those work streams are underway, um, but it's, it is going to be probably um, another five to six months before we will start to see key components of the new program management system brought forward for approval um, and that is because in order to embed these in a, um, a sustainable way going forward, we have to um, work through what it actually means for Calderdale specifically, rather than just generic um, capital program management systems. So that will involve looking at governance systems, for example, which are very important to provide the necessary assurance to senior management and members within an authority, that we are reducing the amount of time spent on governance while simul simultaneously providing the necessary assurance systems that potentially quite large amounts of money require. Um, new computer systems to ensure that we're able to track those, those decisions and those projects through what can, can often be three, four, five plus years are in place and operating effectively. Very often with these sorts of um, process changes, you've got cultural change as well to tackle. So um, I, I would agree that um, we do need to move quickly to address some of the issues which we've raised, but at the same time, these things do take time to ensure that the systems, processes and mechanisms being brought forward are appropriate for the type of authority that Calderdale is. And it's certainly not a one size uh, fits all approach because obviously we've got very large authorities um, and you've got smaller authorities. And as I say, just purely to, to lift and shift other systems which have worked for other local authorities may not offer um, the benefits that actually tailoring it specifically for an authority like Calderdale will bring. I don't know if Rob wants to add anything to that. Just a, just a quick one, uh, just to say that uh, obviously what we've presented today is, is just a very high level summary for, for, for this committee. Uh, there is an implementation plan um, which you know obviously each project lead is, is leading. More than happy to, to go through that 
um, with your councillor Lee or, or other members who may be interested in in that plan, just to see the specific detail about what will be considered in each work stream. It's quite a quite a lot of detail, which is why we summarised it today. But if you feel that you'd, you'd like to go through that, councillor, by all means, happy to to go through that with you. Thank you both very much for that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, James, do you want to? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just had um, one kind of question and point to make, really. Um, I, I think Councillor was right in terms of like the early work that goes into product uh, projects to be sure of them. Uh, one of the points I raised at Council on Wednesday was around how the forecasting of how much capital projects uh, um, are going to cost and how much they en actually end up costing so it is quite often a big discrepancy between them. So I just wondered whether there's work to be done around the modelling of, of what we expect things to be cost so that they're a bit more realistic and uh, accurate based on our past um, past experiences of, of products uh, projects. But one thing I, is, I, do, I do think is important is to remember that the decision as to whether to go ahead with a capital project or not really is a political decision and a democratic decision rather than just purely a technocratic one. So on the one hand, I can see how, you know, having lots of gateways and stuff is important. But on the other hand, people say, well, we elect you as politicians in order, we just want you to get on and do things. And and then you say, well, actually, we can't do this new thing we want because it's at stage two of uh, this particular project. And, and many projects end up taking years and years and years, and you get people being frustrated that things aren't happening. So I'd like to see, uh, you know, in terms of capital stuff, it's around giving the information to the democratic decision makers who are, you know, the cabinet and then full council to approve funding rather than it just purely becoming a, a kind of technocratic thing around aligning stuff with, um, you know, corporate corporate policies and what have you. So all of that stuff is useful in terms of giving information, but we need to remember it's to give information to decision makers. Would you like me to answer those, Chair? Yes, Chair. Yeah. Okay, two, two, I think I've got two questions down here, Councillor Baker. The first is, um, is it possible to accurately predict what ultimate costs will be at the beginning of a, of a potentially quite long-term project? Um, the answer is no. Um, I, I think basically that's why you have a number of stages through FBC rather through to, um, sorry, OBC through to FBC. And, and the best you can hope to do is to start to narrow those costs down so they will become more accurate during the co course of the evolution of those projects. Why is that the case? Um, well, particularly um, at the moment, we've got a lot of volatility. So we've got volatility around COVID-19. We've got volatility around potentially, uh, not potentially leaving the EU, all of which impact upon uh, inflationary costs associated with both labour and materials of projects. I think what you can do is by, by if you like, um, sharpening up the systems that you have in place and the gateway decision making points is that you can make those predictions at the outset of developing a project more accurate, but you can never, and I've never seen it take place yet in my 30 odd years of, of uh, work in, in working on capital projects, an ability for the outset of a project uh, to be, be able to completely accurately predict what those costs, because effectively you're never going to be clear until those tenders come back from um, when you've gone out to the market. There are the ways in which post um, tender process, you can help to keep a more of a control on costs by cha clear change control processes and actually seeking to ensure that once you've, if you like, frozen the design or the detail or the brief for a particular project, that you stick to that as far as you possibly can, but you can never eradicate some of the changes between those initial estimates of costs and that point when you actually get those tenders back. So the best you can do, even with the most effective capital project management system, is seek to reduce some of the, the changes in cost between FBC, uh, sorry, OBC and FBC, outline business case and full business case. In terms of your second point, 
um, the the reasoning behind um, a new capital project management system is not to change the decision making. The decision making is uh, effectively made by uh, members, not officers, but it's to allow, if you like, higher quality information to allow councillors to make informed decisions using the best information that is to hand at the time and bringing all the appropriate issues, including fit around connectivity to policy and uh, most cost effective solutions. But um, officers don't make decisions, mem uh, members do. Great. If I just come back quickly, that's really helpful. Thank, thank you, Mark. I think the point on forecasting was really around, you know, if you're a meteorologist and you had your forecast and quite rightly you say well, it's such a chaotic dynamic system that we can't you know even with advanced AI modeling and a supercomputer we can't always get it right and you, you know these projects are again complex dynamic systems and a project is never going to go entirely to plan however there ought to be some attempt to strive to be better all the time in the forecasting that does occur and there ought to be some process whereby you reflect on it and you look at the methodologies and you look at the, the amount of additional data that is available these days with, with computing and advances in AI, and we come up with better models all the time and strive to get better at predicting things more, more accurately. But yeah, I, you know, I entirely accept your point. You're never going get it, to get it completely right. No, but, I, but I would accept your point, Councillor Baker, that we should strive to get better at this. And one of the things I haven't mentioned is um, that the, the new system will ensure that we do um, a review post -re project reviews um, and, and we do do that but it would be bringing in a system by which the, those post project completion reviews are done in the same way every time to ensure that we learn the lessons from each of those projects which hopefully in, the, in a positive feedback loop will help us to make better decisions going forward. If I could add as well, Chair, if that's all right, uh, it was just to say, really, I think you're absolutely right. Um, it, it is probably one of the most challenging things in, in, that, that we do is, is really to estimate costs at the start of projects. For projects, actually, um, there's about 200 projects going on in, in the council at the current time. For projects that we do regularly, things like schools construction, um, we, we, we actually have a, a, a good body of information there that, that able, is able to, to help us more accurately um, ascertain future cost of capital schemes. And we do extremely well, actually, in the schools environment where it becomes a challenge for us is when we do unusual things, uh, large refurbishments, for example, or anything to do with a listed building is an extremely challenging thing for, for, for any um, QS to, to estimate on the basis that, that you're dealing with huge levels of uncertainty. Obviously, there's lots that we can do around technology, as you've already said, Councillor, to, 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 to make these things more streamlined. But the, 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 the issue is you, you never completely eliminate risk. Construction is, is around managing risk effectively. And there's lots of things we can do around procurement, contracting, uh, and so on. But uh, there's always an element of risk in there. We learn more as we do more construction. And we learn more every time. Which the start of any any project is a lessons learned session before we start to do any any works. But uh, yeah, construction is really about managing risk. The more volatile the external environment that we're dealing with, whether that's the economy, whether that's um, you know a pandemic, for example, the more difficult that becomes. Um, and, and, and we obviously strive to get better every time and we do well on the things that we do regularly, particularly the schools, as, as I say. Um, but, yeah, we can never really eliminate any, any risk from a construction project. Uh, Jane, do you want to come in now? Thank you. Um, as you know, I inherited this portfolio of regeneration relatively recently. And in some ways, I'm exceptionally proud of it. You know, haven't we done well as Calderdale in terms of really punching above our weight and actually attracting capital to the borough? But I think what this particular presentation in front of you tonight represents is looking forward and, and looking forward particularly to the 21st century. There was an emphasis on IT, actually. And as, as project management gets more complex, actually using our IT in a way that really helps us manage uh, these multiple projects is really important. And I think the other thing is that um, it's also about ending some of the silos 
like lots of councils, lots of directorates, all working in silos, schools capital, highways capital, and so on, of actually putting our arms round everything that we can and actually join, joining that up. I think the other thing that while we need a more 21st century approach um, and an IT approach is actually to do with the multiplicity of income streams. We now very often have to com bid competitively for money, WICA, lottery, environment agency, et cetera, et cetera, and actually keeping a handle on the outcomes required from each of those funding sources has become very difficult. Um, now that um, uh, we're leaving the European Union, presumably that's one particular bit of complexity hopefully has gone. But I think it, it's, it's a way of bringing those things, those things together and understanding those complex systems and of course, the government on Wednesday announced that there would be a further infrastructure um, bidding stream and we would have to decide what and if we want to bid for again from that. But that is now the nature of capital projects in terms of the not simply being money from a government department or your own borrowing. There's now this multiplicity of funding streams. And I'm really, I'm actually very grateful to Mark who is leaving us at the end of the year, I'm really grateful to him for giving this a really good look over and just bringing in his experience from other councils and a very different perspective. And I think it will help us going forward. Thank you, Mark. Are there any other questions? Yes, Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Yep. Nobody's saying this is easy, let's be clear about that. It's very difficult, particularly at a time like this. We've had some extraordinary events occur. But, you know, throughout the world, industry, organisations are building things all the time. Everybody has the same problem. And uh, audit itself is about risk management. We'll be hearing from, from more about that later. So everybody else has to do it. But you know what? It's not just the projects where we've had difficulties. And I, I think we should include this somewhere in the, in the plans, Mark, is that we've had difficulties post-project where we've had increases, perhaps absolutely unavoidable. But I think that um, I've been used to tying up deals and contractual deals far more than we've heard of in recent times with after the event, as it were. And so I think we definitely need to look at that. Uh, one of the projects has gone up 100% in about 18 months. Some very strange things have happened, but 100% and we're carrying all of that cost. And when things like that happen, we owe it to ourselves to have contra contractual arrangements that spreads the risk, which is what audit's all about anyway. Right. Uh, through you, Any other? I, I would certainly agree. I think risk management is a key part of the capital management process. Uh, and one of the things we'll be looking at is how do we strengthen the existing um, risk management process that we have within the existing capital programme to both flag up risks um, as early as possible and to ensure that the necessary action can be taken at the, the, the appropriate level to mitigate those risks at the earliest moment possible. Any further questions from members? All right. Um, well, uh, Mark and Robert, I'd like to thank you for your presentation this evening. It has been informative. Um, I was going to ask a number of questions which have already been asked, <laughs> um, but uh, I just leave it by saying um, I look forward to future capital schemes being reasonably on time and to within budget. And I appreciate that's not always 100% possible because of the, it is guesswork at certain stages, but uh, if you're going on the West Yorkshire scheme, that does seem to eliminate 
uh, the extra costs. So I, I look forward to uh, your work being a, a success. And uh, unfortunately, Mark, you won't be here to boast about it when it happens, but I remember who's done it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very, you much, very much to both of you. Um, you, you're quite welcome to stay if you wish, but you can uh, disappear now if you have better things to do. <laughs> All right, thanks. Bye. I know. Uh, so we'll um, move on to five uh, strategic risks. Are you starting out off Martin and doing a double act with devs? Is that uh, how it's going to work? I uh, think, I'll, uh... We'll yeah. do it the same to, same as before. We'll take questions at the end, if that's okay with you both. Uh, and um, over, over to you two. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I'll do a talk about the uh, report and then Debs Harkins will actually talk about the good work that's been done in, in managing the uh, climate change with the environment team. Um, the report brought to you tonight uh, looks at the updates to the Strategic Risk Register focusing specifically on the three risks of COVID-19, leaving the EU and failure to address climate change. If I can start with COVID, since the risks of the COVID uh, pandemic were last reported to Audit Committee, Cordell has joined the rest of the country in a one-month lockdown and will move into Tier 3 on the 3rd of December. Throughout lockdown, directors have been working hard to manage the risks of a second wave. An example of this is like many other local authorities across the UK, our infection rates rose during the start of the second wave of the pandemic. However, we're now seeing the, redu the rates reduce again. This is due to a number of influences, which a major factor is the very effective local contact tracing, which works with the National Trace and Test and Trace to reach 95% of Corvidale residents with a positive test result, which is a, a very strong way of dealing with the number of infections that we're starting, we were starting to see. Since that report um, on the 28th of, December, of September, the Audit Committee, there have been no new risks included on the COVID risk assessment. However, see, there have been changes to the triggers, consequences, and there have been additional actions to manage the risks included. The Council does continue with its Silver Group and Recovery Coordination Group to continue the work closely with service providers and other voluntary organisations and uh, to manage the uh, recovery of Calderdale from the current impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. If we can look at leaving the EU, it had been hoped uh, to, re to report to the meeting that a decision had been made on whether there would be a trade deal in place. However, the latest round of negotiations are still continuing today. It is understood that negotiations have to be completed by the end of the week to allow time for the EU 27 countries to vote on the arrangements. The latest version of the risk and impact assessment has been circulated uh, uh, to members of this committee as an additional item for information following it being taken to the corporate leadership team last Tuesday and the corporate Corridor Reco Recovery Coordination Group on Thursday. I apologise for the fact it was distributed on Friday, but I wish to make sure that any amendments from those other groups have been included before it was circulated around the members. Originally produced in March 2019, the assessment has been continually updated and now following the significant impacts of the COVID pandemic, those where there are significant impacts which have an amplifier effect on leaving the EU impacts, these have now been included on the leaving the EU impact assessment. Although there are significant impacts from a no deal risk exit from the EU, there are a number of risks which will equally apply if we, if we go out with a deal these include the implementation of new border controls. Um, there was evidence uh, earlier on this week of the problems that could occur, how quickly traffic queues formed on the M20 when France tested its new border controls. They are saying that they will have those sorted out by the end of the year and that there should not be any problems on the motorways. The introduction of tariffs, and as Mark mentioned, this will affect uh, the cost of buying in materials for construction from abroad and also the cost of us actually selling uh, materials from the UK into the EU. There are impacts on vulnerable people if we have things like the problems with the border controls or uh, if food prices rise then the people who are impacted first are those who are already vulnerable through COVID-19 uh, and uh, obviously maybe unemployment, recent unemployment. 
There's also the new approach to farming, which has been brought out through the Agricultural Transition Plan, which is uh, looking at farming today is changing. They're taking away the guaranteed subsidies, which were sent, came through from the EU. They're replacing them with a range of environmental grants over a period of seven years. So there'd be a significant change to the way that agriculture is funded. If I can address the strategic risk, failure to address climate change across the authority. One of the council's key priorities is to deliver climate change through a, a range of actions aimed at addressing the concerns raised by the declaration of a climate emergency in 2019. Failure to address the risks of climate change will result in significant impacts, which could potentially include things like increased flooding, small fires, heat waves and water shortages with consequent impacts on the population's health, the, the economy, biodiversity, supply chains and demand for council support services. The risk of not addressing pollution as part of climate change were recently highlighted when the child's death was linked to the higher levels of road pollution in London. The lead officer for this risk is Deborah Harkins, Director of Public Health, who's uh, attending tonight to do a, a talk about what's being put into place to continue to manage the um, impacts of uh, climate change. And um, I'll hand over to Deborah, please, if, if that's okay for her part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm going to start by just a, a really sort of brief overview. And then what I thought I'd do is just highlight some of the things that we've done or that we're planning to do that could help reduce the risk of us not achieving our net carbon um, priority. Um, so, um, so we've made progress um, has been made um, in reducing CO2 admissions right across the borough and in the organisation. We've set up a Calderdale Climate Change Committee to respond to the challenge um, and then um, through that committee uh, cabinet has set a new target for Calderdale to be carbon neutral by net carbon neutral by 2038. Work is underway at the moment to create an action plan um, and an emissions reduction pathway to Calder for Calderdale and um, very much working through the combined authority who has also set a carbon reduction target. It's important that we're all aware that the impact of COVID-19 and the, 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 the two lockdowns on, um, on emissions is it's going to be significant, but it isn't going to be sufficient to facilitate a net zero result. So further work is going to be needed to capitalise on, on the, um, the, the potential provided through the economic lockdown. Um, and um, so what I'm going to do very briefly is just talk through just some of the, um, the key actions that have been undertaken. Um, so um, as I've already mentioned, we've set uh, the council set a target and um, set up a working group. One of the one of the things that's happened recently is um, that a net zero brand has been identified to support engagement um, with the community and promote the council's work to reduce carbon. And um, a really um, big piece of work that we've undertaken is um, our climate friendly employer work. And what that does is that really aims to embed um, work to tackle the climate emergency into every single part of the council through in, and through all of our staff. Staff um, are trained in carbon, uh, low carbon awareness and invited to come up with ideas about how they can reduce carbon through their service areas. The, um, there's also um, conversations that in the routine conversations that happen between managers and staff uh, carbon climate actions now incorporated into those convers shared conversations. Um, and we also promote um, climate um, volunteering as part of our staff volunteering programme. And we also um, do regular communications around climate um, and the climate emergency to staff. As well as that, we've um, reviewed the travel policy to, to incentivise low carbon travel um, amongst our staff. They were the heady days, weren't they, when we used to be able to go out and travel. But um, but uh, but yeah. So when we uh, start to move back to um, uh, slightly more normal working, that those policies will be really important in terms of incentivising low carbon travel. And examples that include um, uh, electronic bikes, e-bikes that are available for staff to use for for shorter journeys. Um, and all reports and decisions are now um, asked to, to consider their impact on carbon reduction. 
um, as we as we move forward with decision making. Um, the next thing I wanted to highlight is, is around the fleets, the council's fleets. Um, we have identified 36 and diesel vehicles, um, probably the oldest and dirtiest of the vehicles, um, and they're now being replaced by electric or hybrid vehicles. Um, the, um, the new vehicles that are replacing them will reduce the emissions for each vehicle by 75%. And actually, the, replacing these 36 vehicles um, was actually, and um, we will deliver a 10% reduction in the whole council fleet in terms of the emissions. We're also um, doing some work um, around installing electric vehicle um, and um, taxi charging points in key sites across the borough. And we've secured £75,000 for on-street residential electronic vehicle charging points as well. In terms of what we're, what we're doing next, um, as I've mentioned already, um, a climate emergency action plan is under development. Um, we are currently developing um, an outline business case for a low carbon district heat network. Um, and um, we are developing um, a green and healthy streets policy um, that will be supplementary planning guidance for our local plan. Um, we are, we've also developed a set of um, performance management uh, measures um, that really reflect the whole breadth of the, the action that needs to be taken to um, address the climate emergency. So looking at sustainable food, looking at transport, looking at business investment, etc. Um, and um, we um, we are also one of the key pieces of action that we're that we're taking to really help us prioritise the action that we need to take to to achieve that net carbon um, target is is um, the lo a local emissions reduction pathway. Um, and what we're doing is we're securing some external expertise to help us work through that that emissions reduction so that we're absolutely clear what are the what are the biggest um most significant actions that we can take to reach to achieve that target the combined the west yorkshire combined authority has done some work on that and now our work at the next stage of that is for us to be really clear about our role in that in calderdale and the and the priority actions that we can take and um, i have one more page i think yeah um finally um we are um uh, doing some, starting to do some community engagement um, around the climate emergency. It's really important that communities get the opportunity to think about how they can play their part and what support they need to play their part. And we're also doing a lot of work um, with the Youth Council and they've made the, um, the climate emergency their priority for engagement with young people for this year. Um, and then finally, um, linking with the previous item, um, there's work that we're planning to align the capital programme with um, the action needed to, um, to deliver our um, net zero carbon um, aspiration. And that's um, my update. Thank you, Chair. Right. Um, thank you, Deborah and Martin. Um, are there any questions? Yes, James. Uh, yeah, thanks for that really useful update on everything we're doing on climate change. That's um, that's really great, Debs. Um, I think my point just uh, just a wider point about the strategic risk register and all the stuff on here. I mean, it's such a useful uh, document for you know senior decision makers within the council to to have. And I think over recent years, you know, down to work of Martin and this audit committee looking at different risks every every audit committee I think it actually has been um, you know improved as a as a document and hopefully it's seen as a bit more as, as a kind of working document that is of actual use to you know the cabinet and, and CLT. Um, I do still wonder though sometimes like how good we are at spotting when a risk is going to be um, triggered and, and one of my frustrations around some of the the COVID stuff was how we had, um, you know, the risk of a pandemic was really high up there. And um, start of last year, I was, I was one of I was people like in the January council meeting really early go, look, this is this is something which is a risk and we need to be aware of this risk. And it almost seemed like it wasn't until 
the government really kicked into action. Everyone else was kicking into action, but we as an authority also kicked into action at the same time. We almost kind of like followed the herd in this country rather than thinking for ourselves and being, you know, ahead of the, ahead of the herd on it. And I just think that sometimes with the strategic risk, you can have them there, but it's like at what point do you spot that there's a potential trigger and who is it that alerts other people to that trigger so we can really, you know, be on the ball with these things. And when I think now it's like we're getting a really good COVID risk register, but actually, you know, pandemic flu risk unfortunately hasn't gone away. We've got exactly the same risk of pandemic flu now as we had before COVID, which is an absolutely horrible for, but you could have both at the same time. And also one of the lessons from like COVID was um, that it was transmitted in a way that was different from flu. So a load of our prep as a country with the Operation Signet was it? it was all based around flu modelling. Well, actually, the Nix virus might be have a different transmission route and it might need completely different interventions to deal with it as well. So I just think we need to be aware of that on that pandemic front. And I guess on climate change, it's like at what point would we say one of our triggers isn't being reached by what we're doing at the moment, we need to do something different. Or at what point would we just say, we've got a committee, we're doing this and that, it's all under control. So what are those, you know, who is it who thinks about that and, and, and alerts when they think a trigger's been set off? Thank you, Councillor Baker. Um, if I can take the, the flu pandemic um, discussion first, please. I have checked actually about flu pandemic and uh, there's consideration that due to the fact that we're in lockdown at the moment, the likelihood of the flu pandemic is reduced following the, the way in the, in the Southern hemisphere, how flu was, has been repressed by the COVID actions. It may well be that we don't see a COVID, uh, a, a flu pandemic of the same proportions we get each year because of the actions that we're taking with the COVID pandemic. However, obviously, people are monitoring this very close to make sure that if we do see signs of flu creeping out, we have to take appropriate actions to manage that as well at the same time. Also, obviously, that there's the pressure um, to make sure that people, everyone, goes and gets their, their flu jab um, when they've got the opportunity to do it. I mean, the, the uptake is, has been low in previous years, and hopefully it will, will be increased this year. Um, the, if I can take your first point... We're actually looking at how we actually manage the directorate and strategic risks. And I'll take on board your comment about how we can get an early warning system built into the directorate and uh, strategic risk register so that we pick these up as, as soon as they're occurring. Um, and uh, hopefully that's the answer to your questions. Great, thanks. Any further questions, Tim? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Stephen. I mean, a couple of comments on what uh, what James has said. I mean, um, <clears throat> there's some of truth in that, but I, mean, I think following um, that being raised at the January council meeting, in fact, um, really throughout February, um, there was a fair amount of work done trying to understand what's going on with pandemic, because it's also worth, worth bearing in mind that a week after that, uh, January council meeting of course we, we were also hit by flooding so I think it's council's had some particular challenges um, this time in in responding to that but I mean it was picked up following that that council meeting actually was reported to both you know there was pretty regular updates at both leaders briefing and indeed um, um, you know group leaders meeting meetings as well from that that point onwards um, but I do think, I mean, that point about the continuing risk of pandemic is a really important one. And of course, it does overlap back into climate change, because a lot of um, modelling work does identify that the risk of climate change and potential shifts in particularly bat and other animal populations actually boosts the likelihood of, uh, of, of further pandemics. Um, in terms of the flu, I mean, Martin's touched on some of the things there, but of course, you, you actually perhaps it's been more obvious through some of the health work than directly the council, but there has been quite a focus on trying to maximise flu vaccination levels, even though the, the sort of early indicators from the Southern Hemisphere was that the flu risks were less. So there has been quite a lot of effort done on um, trying to make sure that the um, level of flu vaccination, flu vaccination take up this year was higher, which I think was, um, was reasonably successful, because I agree it would be a particularly um, double thing. But I think 
you know, I think there'll be quite a lot to to learn from this one. I think the biggest, you know, the biggest challenges in terms of potential pandemic risks is how how do you plan for something that's unpredictable in terms of the risks around different, um, you know, different different transmission models. We've looked quite a lot about what you know what what the the messages have been from COVID, and um, it really is quite quite complex in understanding how how it's different or where some of those risks have come from. Um, I think you know, the thing to be more immediately worried about is kind of have we done everything possible in terms of the risks from Brexit? And as as um, as Martin's summary does, it's it's extremely difficult quite to know what further preparations we should be doing when you know we're a month away from a situation where we still actually don't know what the final challenges for business and hence the potential disruption to some key supplies and services might be. I'm not entirely sure. Anybody else got any thoughts on other things we should be doing over the next few weeks? But I'm not quite entirely, entirely sure what other actions are open to us in that way. I do know, and again, would reassure that in terms of, for example, some of the discussions around capital projects on which we talked about at council last week, of course, um, you know, that question about how do we protect ourselves as far as possible is, is certainly being raised. But, uh, you know, there's quite a number of potential risks and concerns, I think, around that. Do you have any comment on that, Martin, or shall we move on to the next question? Um, it was just, yeah, about the, uh, the the risks of leaving the EU and what we're doing. All we can do is monitor what the government information is being put out. Uh, as I said, that the agricultural uh, transform, uh, transformation uh, plan that came out today, obviously, that will have risks in there which we can now identify following the publication of the plan, because it's quite clear that they're making quite significant changes to the way that agriculture is funded in the country. And this will affect us whether we have a, a no deal or, or a, a, a deal to exit. So it's key that these things are, are looked at. And uh, I think it's something that we need to pick up to make sure that the farmers are aware of the changes that are going to be occurring within the authority. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, do you have a question? Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, just a, a reaction to what uh, Councillor Swift just said. I think he's absolutely correct in surmising that uh, there's little to be done between now and uh, the date that we leave the EU in terms of anticipating what we don't know about. Um, so we just have to wait and see what happens. But I would say this. Um, and I think quali I'm qualified to say this. Uh, I, I was chief exec of a major exporting company. We exported 95% of our production and we got the Queen's Award for Export Achievement because of that. I personally have sold tens of millions of pounds worth of materials overseas, not just in the European arena. And the overriding thing that I would say is businesses are there to do business with other businesses. They're, they're absolutely great at it. And so for every business person in the UK now, there's somebody in Europe that wants to continue doing business with us. My experience has been, whether there are grand plans or not, if you've got good products and you've got good business relationships, businesses will find a way, they're very innovative. Now in that regard, the larger businesses will already have in place their alternative plans for a deal or a no deal. That's what they do, they figure things out. When you consider that uh, a very small minority of businesses in this country actually export anyway, that puts a, a little complexion on it. You know, not all businesses have to worry about this um, and the ones that have been doing it for a long time will have plans in place and of course the other thing that's missing from the risk analysis is there's some positive risks of, uh, of leaving the EU uh, there'll be many advantages um, in leaving the EU and um, we've not yet got to the end of the line here and I'm very familiar with business deals that have been resolved the day before, just when it was looking black, 
you put it all together. So there are some risks, but I think we need to keep them in context. But my, my main question, Chair, was about the uh, climate change comments that were made. I think that, uh, you know, it's whilst it's good that we've made all the arrangements for our own staff to, and, and we have a, you know, a climate emergency policy that everybody's adopting is a good thing. And we need to set an example. And yeah, I don't have any problems with that whatsoever. It's a good thing. However, that will not solve climate change in Calderdale or anywhere else. It's a good thing to do, but it won't. Um, electric hybrids was mentioned by Debs. Um, well, of course, hybrids have been banned now as well. So we need to be careful about uh, what we're spending our money on. There's a limited life for those. Um, and the thing that uh, is a risk is the immense cost of charging points because we can't, we shouldn't imagine that we'll have to put enough points in our towns to satisfy the demand for that. Most people with an electric car will absolutely have to have their own charging points and going out in the morning, you know, will not be, oh, I'll get, you know, I'll charge my car on the way to work this morning. It doesn't work that like that. So charging points in our town centres, whilst invaluable and necessary, won't solve the problem. People will have to charge the cars at home. And we shouldn't underestimate the technical difficulties that we'll be facing in the future of getting those charging points done. And the costs of it can be very, very high indeed, because there's two types of charging. One, a very slow one that charges one vehicle overnight and a quicker one, which is the more practical solution, which most people would want. And they are very expensive. And it, everybody going out in a car every morning after 19, after 20, 30, whatever it is, will have to charge the vehicle with electricity from somewhere. And uh, that is a, a great big challenge and a risk to us uh, lo looking forward. And the only other thing on that is we've got ambitious plans in the local plan for economic growth and where you're boosting an economy and we've got economic growth, it, it usually comes at a price. So we're going to have to be very, very careful about the effects of that economic success on our uh, ambitions to reduce carbon emissions. And finally, there was mention by Martin of uh, warning signs. We do have warning signs and the warning signs are our emission control warning zones, a number of them in Calderdale, all of which have figures where we don't want them to be. You know, our emissions are uh, larger than we would want them to be. None more so, for example, in the lower valley in Brighouse and that sort of area. And you have to remember that we're looking for big economic growth thousands of houses, thousands of people bringing vehicles into Calderdale in an already congested area. So, you know, we need to get on the ball, Debs. If, uh, if we want to reduce these emissions, even for health reasons, we've got to look at our plans to do one thing and consider the risks involved in other desirable policies that we have, such as reducing emissions, because the two are largely incompatible. Thank you, Chair. Any uh, Chair. further questions? Sorry, yes, Chair. Chair, would you mind me just picking up a couple of... Uh, sorry, um, yeah. Yeah, if that's really helpful comments, Councillor Lee, thank, thanks very much. But it's just two, just two things. Um, I should have mentioned in my update the work that the NHS is doing around carbon reduction as well. Um, we had a really um, positive health and wellbeing board development session quite recently where all of our NHS partners came together with, with the council and the voluntary sector um, to, to talk about and explore what we can do together really to, to again, 
make real progress and the um, across um, West Yorkshire and Harrogate the um, integrated care system um, has also sat, uh, set you know an ambitious uh, climate reduction uh, target and and lots of work's going lo lots of work is going on there as well and um, so for example we know that travel to hospital appointments we know that um, there's opportunities to do more digitally in terms of hospital appointments and also the the you know the um, redevelopment of the, our hospital sites can be done in ways that can um, you know contribute to uh, reduced carbon so I would just I, it was remiss of me um, chair not to not to mention that work in my update and then just um, just the one other thing and um, as Councillor Lee's aware um, the, um, the, the the cabinet working group um, on climate emergency is having a session in January uh, to look at the local plan and that um, to absolutely take that point on around the um, think about the co coherence between our climate reduction aspirations and the and the local plan. Uh, I think that'd be a really important session. Thank you. Are there any final questions? Uh, would it okay with that? Um, Martin, have, have, have we been around the, the list uh, that you presented to us, uh, what was it, about 18 months or so ago? Um, no, 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 Chair, you have one more risk to come to the, uh, the group. And, and after that, we were going to talk about whether it might be worthwhile bringing the directorate risk registers to you then, um, following on from that, to give you an idea of where the directorate risks are as, as well. Um, yep. If that would be of use to the uh, committee as, as something as to inform on where the risks are within directorates. Yeah, uh, I think I think that would be a good way forward. Thank, thanks very much, Martin. Uh, thank you both for a, 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 another interesting report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Right. Um, so we'll move on to now the half year report on Treasury management. I assume you're leading on this, Nigel. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, as you just said, the, uh, this is a half yearly report up to the end of September on the Council's Treasury Management function. Um, in summary, the key points are that uh, in the first half of the year, we undertook a very small amount of short term borrowing and actually no long term borrowing in the first part of the year. Um, the Council has actually given borrowing approval of £22 million for the current year, which is in relation to um, schemes that have been approved primarily on Northgate and the LED street lighting. Uh, that borrowing has been approved, uh, but uh, members will be aware that uh, the Chancellor announced in October last year a 1% increase in the PWLV rates. Um, which was primarily because of the concerns about the amount of borrowing by local authorities, particularly in relation to commercial investment. Um, there was, however, a consultation started around uh, PWLB rates. Um, and so we held off from long term borrowing while that consultation was taking place. Um, and hopefully you'll also be aware that um, following the spending review last year, there was an announcement that um, the PW, PWLB um, increase, the 1% will continue to apply for commercial investment by local authorities, but will be taken off for other forms um, of, of borrowing by local authorities. Um, so the borrowing that the council will have to undertake, we will do primarily in the second half of the year now, with that 1% having been taken off. Um, obviously, that will be of financial benefit to the council. Um, in terms of other highlights in the report, um, in terms of the investments, uh, we invested £5 million with council approval in CCLA, which has achieved a return of £90,000 in the first part of the year. The target for the year is £200,000, uh, so uh, not quite halfway there yet, but we'll continue to monitor progress on that. At uh, the 30th of September, the Council had investments of £37.4 million, and uh, those are set out in Appendix 1 to the report. Um, the, the investments and where those are placed are in accordance with the Treasury Management Policy that's agreed by Council each year. And the next update of that will be going to Council in February um, next year. 
but everything that's been uh, invested to date is in accordance with the existing policy. Um, because of the way um, the interest rates at the moment, the return on those investments is relatively small, 52,000, uh, but it, it's, um, it's effectively better than uh, putting it in an account and with no interest on it. Um, so that really is just a, a brief summary of the Treasury management activity during the first half of the year and uh, for Audit Committee to note and uh, to ask any questions on. Uh, any questions? Yes, James. Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Um, I mean, obviously, this details all of our investments that we have in, you know, balances and cash that we put into different funds. It, um, is there a report anywhere in terms of any other investments we've got? Because have we have we not got some in local some local property as well? I mean, is that all done via Weave now, or is there any other investments in in local property, and where would they be reported to if there were? That would be, um, it's included within the council's statement of accounts. Um, it's not, um, it's not recorded in this particular report, this because this relates to just the first part of the current financial year. Uh, and the investments that you're referring to was was obviously done before that. Uh, but certainly we can make information of, uh, available to members about that. But in the first half of this financial year, there's been no investment other than that recorded within um, th this report itself. Great, thanks. Uh, Stephen. Thank you, uh, Chair. Just uh, one interesting one for me, please, Nigel. Um, on the report on the long term, on 8.3, it refers to um, um, the amount of interest paid on our long-term debt in the period was to about 2 million. Is that for the six months or for the 12 months, first of all? Because it refers to the first six months of the financial year earlier in that paragraph. So it's, so it's either... Two million for the year, or it's looking like it, you know, pro rata, it would be four million for the year if that was only for six months. And the other thing, Nigel, don't expect an answer to this immediately, but uh, if we're paying interest of two million for whatever that period is, could we have some figures about the amount of actual debt repayment as well? Because it all adds up to something that has to be paid back month in, month out. And I'd like to get a handle on that if that's possible, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, on that particular point, the, that's the interest payable in the first part of the year. Um, the, uh, the interest rates on our loans vary quite significantly. Um, because of the fact that we undertake borrowing over a long period of time. And as you'll appreciate, those interest rates have varied hugely over recent years. Um, we've had a policy of trying wherever possible to, to repay any uh, loans um, that were at uh, uh, what now can, can, might be considered to be excessive rates, but it's all relative. Um, but clearly you try to do that and you have to make um, uh, basically repayments um, to, to actually break out of existing loans. Um, in terms of, um, yes, I can, I can provide a report and information about uh, the actual debt outstanding. There's an appendix to the report that shows the spread of debt over a period of time. What we try to do is actually even that out so that the debt each year isn't lumpy so that we've not got huge repayments one year and next to nothing the next. So when we actually take out borrowing now, we look at, well, a number of factors, but one of them is to try and spread the debt so that we're not having to make excessive payments or repayments each year, but also um, what's the interest rates for those borrowings? Because clearly it might be nice to spread it over a period of time, but if the interest rates for a particular period are higher than others, then that has to be factored in as, as well. So we take into account all those things in terms of what the underlying interest rates are for various periods, because the council could borrow 
for anything between um, one year and 50 years through PWLB. And we have to look at that each time to, to, to consider, as I say, the balance between the interest rate that's payable and also spreading the risk over a period of time. But I'm quite happy to make available information that shows um, how that debt will be paid off over a number of years. Uh, thank you, Chair. So just to get this straight, so the interest rate payable is for six months. So if it were pro rata, it would be four million, not not the two million in in the report. And let's just take an example of a fifty year um, payback time. That's the best uh, longest period we can get. And if in round terms we've got a hundred million on providential prudential um, borrowing, that would be two million a year. So we might expect that the amount of payments on capital repayments and interest could be in the region of what, six million a year? Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we um, I say the interest rate will vary according to every single loan. Some of them um, say might be four or five percent from previous years when interest rates were at those levels. The kind of borrowing we're taking out now, um, with the um, the, re the most recent announcement, we can probably borrow long term at less than two percent at the moment. Um, so the, there is quite a, a variance in the interest rates, um, but um, again, that's that's something we monitor on a regular basis. We'll take it uh, that that those loans out at the most advantageous time to ourselves. It's, so it's difficult to know what, what might happen with those interest rates in future. Um, but you're right about what we have to do in the accounts is charge the interest, but also um, charge something we call the mi minimum revenue provision, which is um, a bit similar to depreciation in private sector accounts. So depending upon the life of an asset, we will charge something to the revenue account each year which depends upon the life if it's if it's a new building we will probably charge that over a 50-year period if it's a piece of it equipment we might charge that over five years and so we have to charge that each year regardless of the the loan repayments because the loan repayments are cash what we have to charge into the revenue account is the minimum revenue provision like i say which is is very similar to depreciation uh, but i'm quite happy again to to kind of uh, put all that information into a report if it would be helpful any other questions all okay well thanks very much for that uh Report, Nigel, and just remind members that it is a, a very small team <laughs> that does this for us, and, and I always feel that they do a very good job. So thanks for that. Um, so we'll move on to the uh, internal audit. Lisa. Thank you, Chair. This is another half-year report. Um, this um, goes into detail about the work of internal audit in the first six months of the year. Um, it's for information and noting as is the previous one. Um, I won't go uh, through all the report in detail, happy to answer any questions, um, but perhaps some just some things to highlight. Um, at this point in the year, unusually, um, we've only undertaken 20% of the audits on the audit plan. And that is in the main due to the work that the team's done on COVID, um, in particular the COVID grant work. This will continue in the second half of the year because of the other grants which have been announced. Um, just to assure members, we are keeping the audit plan under review. We have met with all directorate management teams to discuss the progress with audits um, within their directorates um, and to reprioritise any accordingly. Um, we discuss those with direct management teams, but obviously we have an independent view and the ones that we believe are of priority will be delivered. Um, any that we don't do this year will go on to next year's plan. And... Um, but that is something that we're doing on an ongoing basis. Uh, I will formally report on the revised plan at the next meeting scheduled in February. Um, just to highlight, we have had some changes in the team as well. 
um, we've got lost one member, one internal auditor, and another one is due to leave also, but recruitment is ongoing for those posts. Um, as usual, we've reported on um, our performance indicators, which um, because of the disruption of the COVID-19 and as positive as they are, have been in previous years um, due to delays of being broken off on COVID grant related issues. Um, we've got client questionnaires, not as many responses as we usually have, but that's primarily because we haven't done as many audits but positive in terms of um, good responses to those questions um, in terms of assessing the service we provide. Uh, we have undertaken all um, responsive work requested either by directorates or a request for investigations, et cetera. Um, and there is a section within the report summarizing the outcomes of, of that work and other ongoing work as appropriate. Happy to take questions from members on any of that work, if anybody wants any further details. Are there any questions, Lisa? No, easy ride tonight, Lisa. Um, Thank you. Right, thanks. Oh, yes, uh, Jane. I don't think I can let this report um, go, and I'm sure Chair and Committee will agree with me. Um, what you've said at 4.14 really is, is a, a short summary of the amazing work that you've done very quickly to pivot and to start working on the COVID assurance process and the COVID grants. And there are many businesses out there that are very grateful to you. And actually the council's own probity in terms of making sure that, you know, as, as far as we can, that there isn't fraud and that the money does go to the right place really. So. Thank you to you and the team from all of us, I'm sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so move on to item eight, the Redmond review. Uh, is this you, Nigel? You sound, you on sound there? Yeah, I don't know whether it was myself or Lisa, but I'm quite happy to, um, uh, to talk through that, if that's okay, Chair. Um, very briefly then, uh, the Redmond review, uh, Sir Tony Redmond, is a, a review of the effectiveness of local audit, and by local audit we mean external audit for our purposes, and the transparency of financial reporting. It was published in September, and uh, there's quite a lengthy report, and a summary is uh, appended to the report tonight, but the key points are probably in paragraph 4.4 of the report, which is really to say that um, a new body, um, which is smaller and less expensive than the audit committee, is to be established to um, regulate local audits and to, to oversee its effectiveness. Um, the fee structures for local audits are to be revised. Um, and I think we can take that to mean that they should be actually increased. There's been concerns expressed by um, all the, the main audit firms that um, they, they cannot sustain the audits as they are at the moment within the fee structure that's been set nationally. And as part of this review, it is recommended uh, that those fee structures be reviewed and increased. Um, MHCLG has been invited to review its framework for ensuring local authority sustainability and ensuring that um, our external auditors um, take a view and, and actually reflect on findings from other organisations such as Ofsted and CQC, etc., as part of their audit. Um, a standardised statement of service income and costs be prepared alongside the statutory accounts comparing the outturn with the budgets. So that's similar in a way to the report that we take to Cabinet uh, um, on closing down the accounts and it's comparing the budgets with the, the outturn costs. I think some of us hoped that there might actually be some form of um, standardisation or, or more reduction in the amount of information that we have to put into the statutory accounts, the statement of accounts because as you are aware from the discussions last week, it's rather a lengthy document that we have to comply with those accounting standards. 
Uh, but actually the findings of the Redmond review is that we should supplement that with this standardized statement comparing budgets and outturn information. Uh, the deadline for publishing the audited local authority accounts um, should be revisited with a view to extending it from the 30th of September to the 31st of July, sorry, to the 30th of September from the 31st of July each year. There's no proposal to actually extend um, the deadline for the, um, the draft accounts that we have to prepare within the local authority, which um, as far as we understand will continue to be the end of May. And then the final recommendation is that audit committee should have an independent member, um, but it doesn't stipulate within the review whether this should be remunerated or not. And um, we're aware that there's obviously been discussions at audit committee in the past about uh, obtaining an independent member. So those are the main findings of the review and um, I'll pause there and uh, ask if there are any questions. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think with the independent member, I think uh, Lisa has tried very hard to try and get somebody to do it for nothing. <laughs> and I think that's an, <laughs> that's a non-runner now. <laughs> but uh, so I, I think we ought to sort of, uh, you know, sort of get some sort of figure, which and, and not the ten thousand, which uh, the, the person who first informed us that we ought to have an independent member about a year ago. Uh, EB thought that they should be paid ten thousand a year, which. Uh, uh, nearly give me wallet failure. <laughs> uh, so um, I think you've you've covered all the things that I was. That, uh, the external auditor would be extremely pleased to see about the possible increase in fees for him, but hopefully that will be uh, less than the uh, inc the savings on the cost of the provision of the service. Uh, from, from the national body, it's the change in national body that's going to rule, you know, rule it. Uh, are there any questions, anybody? Yes, Tim. I mean, I'm, just to comment, to take take your point about the, yeah, the the difficulty of securing a, securing an independent member. I did notice that Leeds Leeds Council were just advertising quite recently for an independent member of their audit committee, so it might be just be worth talking to them. I guess they've probably got a bigger pool of potential people just because of Leeds. My recollection is they weren't paying a lot effectively. They were paying an allowance, not unlike we pay sort of independent members of the standards committee. So I think it was in, it was certainly in the hundreds rather than the tens of thousands anyway, kind of range. So but it might be worth chatting to them about their experience or indeed if they have a, a lot of applicants, <laughs> seeing if there's any interest. Yeah. Yes, thanks for that. Um, any other comments or observations? All right, so that's, uh, thanks for that. We'll move on to the internal audit services tracking report, Lisa. Thank you, Chair. This is the usual report which we present to each meeting of the audit committee. This updates members on the position with audit reports which have been issued this year to date, um, stating what the audit opinion was, the uh, number of recommendations and the progress in implementing recommendations. Just by way of an update, all the reports which are shown on the appendix one, which um, says in draft, have now been finalised, so have been issued with an audit opinion. Um, the one audit which was shown as later follow-up, we've now received that follow-up. Um, there are no new weak audits on the tracking report, um, so those are um, on occasions ones which members select to be the member selected report. As I explained in the previous item, we've done less audits, so there's potentially less for you members to choose from there. Um, there's nothing that particularly stands out to me as being one for me to suggest, but quite happy to take questions from members or suggestions if members want to select one for the next meeting. Have we, I think we've looked at CCC, the CCG payments in the past, haven't we? Is, is, is that worth another look? Because it's, it's, you know, in this recent one, it's come back as weak again, hasn't it? So it's... Yes, 
Yes, Chair. We we discussed that one at the not the last meeting, but the, the one prior to that, at which point it was weak. We will continue to do follow up work on that until it moves from the status of weak to let's hope it sounds at the very least adequate. We have actually now got an internal auditor who is working with the team implementing those recommendations. So we've got that ongoing dialogue so we can see what progress is being made. I would suggest that if progress isn't being made, we would select that again in, in the future. But I think it's too early to select it at this stage because some of the actions are going to take some time to implement. Uh, yes, Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I must say that uh, in view of everything that's been happening this year, the department's done an amazing amount of work and uh, yeah, congratulations are due for that. As you know, Lisa, I always look for the warning lights. So there's very few red markers on this report this time. And where there are, they're, they're heading in the right direction in every case, one's awaiting something or other. So my usual question is, uh, of all of that, I think you've already answered this. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to particularly highlight to us as members of the audit committee that are giving you any concern at all moving forward? Just to confirm, no, there aren't. There, there's nothing, no areas of concern to highlight that I would like to suggest, as indicated by the report, they would be there in red um, if that was the case. Uh, yes, Sylvia. Uh, thank you, Chair, for letting me speak. It was just um, really to back up what Lisa was saying about the CCG. Um, because part of the work that has to be done there is to have better IT system which is fail safe and make sure that the staff, all staff are picking up on this and so again I, it's on my radar as, in, as relevant to the IT part of my portfolio and I'll certainly be keeping on top of that so I just think at the moment it's too early to look at that again. Thank you. Um. Just sort of uh, looking at the report, um, I think it's uh, we, we should look for one where we, we can sort of say just how well the council is doing, whether the uh, sound reports and the follow-up is uh, sound. And I just wondered if members uh, fancied the, uh, the culture council-wide, uh, whether that could be uh, an interesting thing, one to look at. Uh, and sing the praises of our staff for a change. Are we all happy with that? Is that okay with you, Lisa? Absolutely fine, Chair. I, I assume um, it, it's just going to be um, an overview of what the audit was about, uh, yeah. some of the findings, and, and you, you don't need anybody to come to, to, oh, no. to speak yeah. about. Unless that's somebody's mad, mad enough to want to come to it. <laughs> that's fine. Um, I report I'll be prepared for the February meeting on that. That's great. Thank you. Um, right, so we'll, uh, just the work plan now. Um, have you any comments on that, Lisa? Oh, James. Sorry, Chair. No, just at some point, I wonder if it was something we could look at on audit committee, or maybe it's just something to ask Lisa to to take a look at. I was just wondering, really, because at the moment we're in the process where we've got the um, the town fund boards that have been set up with the council as the um, reportable body for them, and I thought it might be worth something audit committee looking at in terms of checking up on their governance structures and all the declarations of interests on people on those. Boards. I know declarations of interest was one of the things flagged by our external auditors at our last meeting. And I just thought that at some point they would have all put in their applications that would all be sent off. So it's probably like there's a small window now probably just to check up and everything's in order and they're all progressing properly and all their government structures are working well. And I thought, would that be something of an audits committee because we're the reportable we're the reportable body as, as the local authority? So is that something perhaps we could look at at our at an audit committee meeting. 
Thank you, Councillor Baker. This is actually something which is on um, internal audits radar, and we have had a look at arrangements for, for town boards. Um, and following the last meeting um, where the issue of declaration of interest for members was raised, I have asked for that to be looked at as a check. Um, so we can report back on that to a future meeting um, and to give members the audit committee assurance regarding that um, if members want to see that. I think so. It's potentially a lot of money, isn't it, with the grants going in? We want to be make sure we're doing it properly. That's fine. Thank you. All right, so we'll uh, move on to the audit committee work plan. Um, have you anything to add to the reports, Lisa? Or? The only thing that members may notice is I've highlighted in yellow above the meeting scheduled for the February, the 15th of February, um, a potential meeting for members ahead of the actual official audit committee where members could review the effectiveness of the audit committee. This is something that we've had on the work plan for the committee to do. It was cancelled back in April because of um, COVID-19. I just thought if members could spare 30 minutes prior to the meeting, we could go through that self-assessment um, and then we can report officially through the audit committee at a future meeting the outcome of that, which will review any identified improvements. Um, we will consider the issue of the independent member um, situation. I will, be prior to that meeting, um, discuss with... Um, other local authorities such as Leeds and other local authorities who I know have got an independent member to identify what their remuneration package is and see if we can um, learn anything from how they went out to recruit but we can discuss that and other things at that pre-meeting if other members are in, in agreement. Are we, is everybody okay for the um, Monday the 15th of February for that to take place at uh, half past five start? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Uh, so with that, um, thank you very much, Lisa. And thanks everybody um, for their contributions this evening. Uh, and uh, if I don't see you again, uh, have a very Merry Christmas, you all, hopefully. <laughs> hey, thank you, Chair. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Merry Christmas.